Well, anything new the last three months? <laughs> Been visiting with the president. Um, n- no, nobody writes a life plan for for what you've experienced. Um, you, you have been pretty consistent about saying, yeah, you know, there has always been a life plan, and that's to be a disciple of Jesus in whatever situation we're in. But, um, okay, what's it like having people greet you on the street that you've never met uh, to, to be the most famous doctor couple in America? Uh, what, how's life right now? You're right. We never, uh, we never planned for this. Um, we thought we were going to go serve at a mission hospital somewhere in total anonymity and spend our days there. And now we're being greeted by people at Walmart and Cracker Barrel. And, um, you know, the only people who have said anything to us are the people who come up and they want to shake our hand. They want to say, it is so good to see you. We're so thankful that you're well. We've, we've been praying for you. Uh, so that's, it's been bizarre, but, uh, but not, not too bad. How about you? I couldn't have ever foreseen that we'd be sitting here with you like this, Randy. So it has been bizarre, just like you said. We, I don't think it's fully sunken in that why all these people would want to come here to, to talk to us. And I, I think um, a lot of people have a lot of curiosity about what kind of people you are. Um, what, what, what kind of people, when, when Ebola comes to the country you've chosen to serve, move forward and not backwards? Um, the kind of people who stop on their way here to give to give plasma to to, to somebody who who needs it. Um, what, what kind of people are the are the Brantleys? That's what people want to know. Regular. We're just regular people. <laughs> I think that's a great answer. We we have been labeled as narcissistic idiots and we've been labeled as heroes and we hopefully don't feel like either Um, we're just two ACU alumni who were seeking to be faithful to God's call in our life and for us that meant moving to Liberia and we moved there to serve the people of Liberia uh, particularly in their need for medical care. So the Ebola virus showing up doesn't change our goal or our purpose for being there. And to us, it only made sense to join in the fight. When a disaster strikes where you are, your options are either to leave or respond or become part of the disaster. Um, and maybe I did a little of both. <laughs> um, w- when I first heard that you, you had Ebola, it was like all the air went out of the room. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't breathe. I can't imagine what that conversation was like as you were telling your wife that you had Ebola and um, you've seen a lot of people die did, did, it, did it feel like a death sentence and, and what, what does faith do in, in that moment I had witnessed a lot of people die even before Ebola came to Liberia just in regular medical care, death was so present. Um, and it was, it's traumatic. And death is no, no discriminator of people. It's an equal opportunity 
uh, event. And I had seen a lot of people die from Ebola. When I got sick, we had only had one survivor. So every Ebola patient I had seen, save that one, had died a miserable death. Um, when I was told, Kent, your test was positive, I didn't, I didn't think about death immediately. My thought was, okay, what's next? What's our plan? How are we going to handle this? And how am I going to tell Amber? Death became more uh, real as I got sicker. And my, my good friend and, and colleague, Dr. John Fankhauser, was one of the doctors primarily taking care of me. And every day he said, Kent, you look like a survivor. There's just something about you. You're going to make it. I just know you're going to make it. And I, I chose to believe him every day. And it worried me because I, he, wasn't, he wasn't telling me that about my friend Nancy Wrightville, who also had Ebola. So in some ways, I was more concerned about losing my friend. I was afraid that Nancy was going to die. I was more concerned about that than I was about my own mortality because I had people around me speaking life into me. And you're a long ways away. You're in the, you're in the U.S. and he's over there. What are you thinking? Um, I, was, I was here in Abilene and I was just so sorry when he, when he told me. I was just so sorry for him. <laughs> I'm sorry for myself, but mostly just sorry for him. And I didn't know how I could help him in that fight, being so far away. Um, when, when, when we talked um, sh shortly after you'd been diagnosed, you, you shared a passage with me, you said, this, this is the passage I'm, I'm living out of. Story of the three Hebrew boys. You know, share just a little of, of that. I'm not quite sure why in that moment I identified with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they faced a literal fire for their uncompromising faith in God, their, their unwillingness to bow down to an idol. And they said to the king who was threatening to execute them, O king, our God can save us from you, and he will. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your idol. And I wasn't facing a literal fire. And I wasn't facing a, a egomaniac king who wanted to execute me. But I was facing death. And I... I prayed, God, I know you can save me. But even if you don't, I want to be faithful to you. And I don't, I don't know where that came from, except from all of the prayers of the many friends and relatives and complete strangers who were praying for me and specifically my friends and supporters who had been praying for my faith for months as we worked in Liberia. A 
um, the, the, the whole discussion of, uh, of Ebola has shifted quite dramatically in the last few weeks. And I know you both have an enormous burden for that. What do you want the world to hear about Ebola in West Africa and Ebola in Dallas? Let me start with Ebola in, in Dallas and Ebola in the United States. There's been so much media attention in the last few weeks about the new case of Ebola in the United States and do we need to panic? Is this going to be uh, an, a pandemic? And first I want to say to the family of Mr. Duncan that I'm heartbroken for them. And, and my deepest sympathies go out to them. Ebola is a terrible, ugly, devastating, humiliating disease. And it strips the dignity from people while taking their lives. It's serious. It's, there's a reason it's one of the most feared diseases in the world. And for those people who have been identified as, as contacts of an Ebola patient, it's a serious thing. And they need to, to take it seriously. They need to not hide, but present themselves to the authorities. They need to monitor themselves for symptoms. They need to cooperate with the CDC. But for the rest of us, we don't need to be afraid. We're spending too much time in panic and hysteria instead of doing what's important, and that is seeking a solution to this global problem. That is finding ways to stop this, this epidemic in West Africa. People are afraid of an airplane flying over and what if it passed through Dallas airspace and gets Ebola on it? Um, we, need to, we need to put that behind us and figure out how to love our neighbors. Our neighbors who are in Dallas, our neighbors who are in Nebraska and Atlanta, and our neighbors who live on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean who have faced so much more devastation from this disease than we can imagine. We've been worked up and, and had a kind of a national frenzy about one new case of this disease while the World Health Organization says there have been over 8,000 cases in West Africa in the last 10 months and, and over 3,800 deaths. And we need to stop worrying about the irrational and start figuring out how to love our neighbors and how to, to effectively end this outbreak in West Africa. Uh, and and uh, you, you think those numbers could get much worse? I think those numbers are worse. <laughs> I, I think it's actually worse than those numbers lead us to believe. And, and there's no question that they will get much, much worse if effective action is not taken. Um, okay. Uh, can I ask you a theology question? Shoot. That was rhetorical. Okay. Um, um, you're, you're obviously people of, of deep faith and... Uh, you know, you, you, you closed your national interview by, by saying, God spared my life, how can I not glorify his, praise his name? Um, 
how do you think about the actions of God in the world full of Ebola? Um, that, that those tough questions about, um, boy, there seem to be a lot of lives God's not sparing. Um, how, how do you think about a loving, compassionate God in a world of suffering that you've seen up close and personal and participated in? How, how are you thinking about that these days? That is a difficult question that people have wrestled with for centuries. And I, I can't give you a, a, a nicely packaged answer for that. It breaks my heart to see the suffering of my friends, my colleagues, and the, my patients. It breaks my heart. And there's a tendency to ask, where is God in this? Scripture says, in all things, God works. It doesn't say all things are good. It doesn't say God does all things, causes all things to happen. It doesn't say, follow God and life will be easy. In our very difficult circumstances God has worked and not only to bring about my physical healing for which I'm incredibly grateful but we've seen God working in the lives of people all around us people we don't even know who say because of what you have gone through and what I've witnessed in your life I'm a different person I have started praying for the people of West Africa. My faith has been strengthened. My family is closer. And, and I see that as the work of God, taking this awful, terrible thing and working in it to bring about something beautiful from the ashes. And I can't give an explanation for why I lived while other people died and while other people continued to die. But it's not my responsibility to, to figure out why. It's my responsibility because I survived and because I'm alive to do something with that life I've been given. And it's our responsibility, whatever our circumstances, to use what we have in a way that glorifies God, to, to love God and to love our neighbors. Uh, yeah. Do you ever get up in the morning where that feels a little heavy? Where in, in some ways, uh, not the only, but you have become one of the faces of what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus in extraordinarily difficult circumstances. And what does that feel like to get up in the, in the morning to, to know that's now part of your identity I don't think that's been my first thought in the morning yet thanks Randy <laughs> it's, just something to think about. it's a it's a huge responsibility and um, I don't want to treat it as a burden but it, it's heavy um, it's a responsibility and 
so many people have prayed for us and prayed for Kent and we need those prayers to continue that we steward this responsibility and, and do it well what do you think good answer <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll go back to Amber's previous answer we're regular people we're not we're not capable of being superhuman. And we're not perfect, and we never will be in this life. But what we can try to do is to be faithful today. And when we wake up tomorrow, we'll try to be faithful again that day. Um, on, on another hand, though, it's it's not fully dependent on us. As we seek to be faithful to God, He grants us what we need to, to honor that. And, and His faithfulness is far greater than ours. So we feel that responsibility when we sit in front of thousands of people and talk with you that more people are watching us now than they were before. But our, our responsibility is to be who we were before or maybe a little better than we were yesterday. Uh, you, uh, you seem to really uh, believe that God gave you what you needed in the moment at each step along the way. That in, in response to your faithfulness to God that he'll give you what you need that day. Is that, is that your experience? Is that core conviction? That is a core conviction for me. Not, not that it's because of my faithfulness that God gives me what I need. And when I say he gives me what I need, it's not a $20 bill in my pocket or a, a well-paying job. It, it's that when I'm laying in my bed 3,000 miles from my wife dying, I hear the words, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that's, that's what I needed in that moment. Not, not anything big or spectacular or supernatural, but to know that whether I live or die, nothing can separate me from the love of God. And what, what more do you need than that? Um... When, when these extraordinary things happen to you, uh, there, there, there seems to be a sense in which you were spiritually ready. And a, a lot of times the events in our lives that are the most uh, uh, formative or, or have the most impact on our lives are things we never see coming. So what would you say, especially to our students, about how do you prepare for the attack that you never see coming? Because you both seemed like you were extraordinarily ready when it happened, ready for that moment. All along the way, we took little steps. We didn't get to Liberia as medical missionaries by a giant leap. It was one little step after another little step after another little step. And those little steps are important. 
You have to be faithful in the little things before you can be faithful in the big things. And we... If, if the events that we've been through had happened a year ago, we probably wouldn't have handled it the same way as we did this time. And if it happens a year from now, well, what has transpired between now and then will probably greatly impact the way we handle it then. You've got to make the little decisions. And you've got to make them now. We, we talked with some students earlier today about preparing yourself for medical missions. And that's a long, that's a long road of education <laughs> to prepare yourself for that. And so many people who start down that road get distracted along the way. And we talked about trying to be intentional about keeping that focus and going on short-term mission trips and going to mission conferences and not only nurturing your, your medical education, but also your spiritual education and your spiritual nature. And those take lots of little steps, lots of intentional decisions today for today. Can I tell a short story? I have a good friend from our church in Fort Worth. He may be here today, I don't know. And he, he was supportive of us during our four years in Fort Worth and encouraging to us as we set off for Liberia. And in early April, Amber and the children were evacuated from Liberia because of the Ebola outbreak. And they later got to come back. But at that time in early April, I got a text message from this friend in Texas the day or two after, the, after Amber and the kids left that said, I am fasting in prayer for your faith today. That blew me away. I've had hundreds of people tell me over the last couple of years, I'm praying for you, you're in my thoughts, so oh, thinking about you today, praying for your ministry when you go over there. But he wasn't praying for my general well-being or my health or my ministry or he, he was fasting in prayer for my faith. And it blew me away. I picked up the phone and called him and thanked him for that. And I know that that, that prayer continued. That was not a one-time event for this friend. That's who he is. And when I was recovering in Atlanta, he sent me a message by another friend that said something to the effect of after a week of fasting and praying I understand a little bit better what it means to rely on God thank you for the way you have helped my faith in the Lord grow something like that and my response to him is I had nothing to do with that I had nothing to do with that. He was praying diligently that God would increase my faith. And as a result, his own faith was strengthened. And he made that decision, that little decision, I'm going to pray for my friend in Africa that God would strengthen his faith. And he was he was diligent in that prayer and as a result his own faith has been strengthened and that's not from me that's that is from god uh how many times have you been asked the question uh, would you do it over again i don't know how many times people have asked us that no. but i i think we would I think we would. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to expound on so, that? <laughs> someone asked earlier if our experience in the last three months has made it scarier to think about 
doing it again? And Amber answered that question and said, yes. Yes, it has. But again, our, our responsibility is to be faithful today. To be good parents to our children. To be faithful partners to one another. And when or if the Lord leads us back to Liberia or West Africa or some other mission field, I think we'll be ready if we've made those small decisions of, of faith and obedience every day along the way. Um, as, as, I've, as I've listened to you, it's, it's been clear that um, You know, pe 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 people always want to ask about. Okay, you you took your you took your children to to Africa. You know, as if no, we went and left them behind would be um, you know kind of a possibility. But 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 I was struck by your. It's very important to you that they grow up with the value of knowing that that librarian is their neighbor. I mean, that's that's kind of that seems to be a pretty core value to you too. Is that, is that right? Is that the way you think about it? And when you think about this is a package deal, the whole family's in this. Sure, it is a package deal. Um, the Lord called me, the Lord called Kent, the Lord gave us our kids. So it's a, it's a complete package, we're all going. Um, and I, I just hope that we can somehow through our through our messy days even can can demonstrate to our kids how good and faithful the Lord is and that if our children can grow up and proclaim that he is God and that Jesus is his son then what is there anything greater Um, okay, I promised I would ask you uh, this to, to save you having to be asked it a thousand times. Um, what, what are we doing next? What, what's, what's in the future for the Brantleys? We don't know. <laughs> That's the short answer. Is, is there a longer answer or is that, is that's, that it? That's the answer. That's the answer, okay. Then, then that'll be fine. Um, um, uh, how do you how do you think about uh, as, as as we move towards conclusion? How do you, how do you think about prayer today? You got people you don't even know. If you, you have people that love you, you've got this. this stream of prayers what do you what do you think those how, how are you thinking about how are you thinking about prayer now I don't claim to know how prayer works I don't I, I don't understand the effects it has on events in the world but I know that prayer transforms people and that as we turn to God in prayer especially prayer for our neighbor it transforms us and how can you not have compassion on someone that you're praying for and and I've been the recipient of so much compassion. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, and, I, and I hope that it leads me to a, to a life of prayer for my neighbor in the way that so many people have prayed for me. I don't know how prayer works either. But... Um, 
my thoughts on prayer is what, what a wonderful gift it is that we have this direct line to the almighty creator and he hears it. It's just a wonderful gift. That's, I, we have a lot to learn <laughs> theologically about that. Um, Dr. Schubert is uh, going to come up in just a moment here and present you with something. I, I, I guess I want to say on the, on, on the kind of the way out of this, um, yeah, I, I, know, I, know, I know you're regular people. Ordin, ordin, ordinary people um, thrown into extraordinary circumstances. Um, but I just don't see how anyone could have done it better. And I, I just want to say thank you for representing, I know you didn't ask for it, but representing Jesus so well. We're very grateful. Randy, thank you. Um, yeah, please have a seat. Just a couple, couple more minutes here. Um, thank you guys for an amazingly powerful story of listening to God and having the courage. Uh, I know that uh, all of us, I think, at times in our lives, we wonder, can we see and hear clearly the call that God has for us? And maybe other times we may see and hear it, but we ask ourselves the question, do we have the courage to heed it? And so what you've done today is give us all a, such an incredibly powerful reminder of being willing to, number one, recognize that God has a call for every single one of us. He has destined us for greatness according to what he's called us to do in the world. And it the ability to hear that and believe it, have the confidence that God truly does make a difference through the lives of each one of us, sometimes starting in places where you can't imagine where it's going to go, but realizing that God is faithful, and if we will have the courage to trust Him in that, He will take us and do great things. And I hope that you guys have been encouraged as, as I have been encouraged today uh, in that regard. I've spent a pretty limited time with Kent and Amber but one of the great things about them is this is really uncomfortable for them. You could tell that a little bit. But it's grounded in that amazing graciousness and humility of truly wanting to just be about the business that God has put in front of you in your lives. And what just an amazing testimony that this is about the power of our Lord and Savior and how he works in us to do great things if we will trust him. We spent some time trying to think about what would be a meaningful gift to you guys. And Kent, when we realized uh, that you were sick, we reached out to the ACU community and we asked for people to pray and to give their blessing and lift you guys up, you and your family. And most of that was done via Facebook. And the one great thing about social media is that it can take any specific event and take it truly all over the world and, and raise awareness and support but it also doesn't have a permanence that the kind of outpouring of love and support that was submitted on your behalf deserves. And so one of the things that we've done is taken so many of the words and the prayers that were submitted probably by many people who are here in this room today on your behalf and put them uh, into a book that we hope will provide a blessing and a reminder of the love that we have and support for you guys as you travel through with the rest of your journey. 
Uh, join me again in thanking Kent and Amber.